The year is 2063 or whenever. We're all being driven around by autonomous electric cars, desktop monitors are considered retro, and Star Citizen has just entered beta. Somewhere between 50 and 400 million kilometers away on a dusty red planet, the first ribbon cutting ceremony has just concluded, founding the first official Martian city. Hey guys, and welcome back to another space video. Today we're diving into how we'll be powering Mars. My name's Corvus and you're watching White Fox. Let's dive in. A lot of science fiction is really just science plus time. We saw tablets in Star Trek in the 60s, many different franchises showed us talking over live video feeds that we carry around in our pockets, and of course you can't forget the aforementioned self-driving cars. We are going to Mars, and in fact it might not be entirely accurate to say that since we're technically already there, but it is just a matter of time before the first humans land there, making mankind multiplanetary. Now it might be simple to power a settlement designed to house a couple of astronauts who would undoubtedly be well versed in the art of survival, but half a dozen astronauts on Mars hardly means humanity has become multi-planetary. For me, that means at least a city's worth of people. Civilizations of course need energy to survive, but nowhere is power going to be more important than on an interplanetary colonization effort where we'll need to produce oxygen, water, nutrition and fuel. Back here on Earth, assuming you don't live in South Africa, it's pretty easy, relatively speaking, to keep the power on. And I'm not saying it's a good thing that we're still this reliant on it, but the Earth does give us a power source in the form of fossil fuels which still provide around 80% of the world's energy. If that wasn't good enough, we've got a relatively thick atmosphere with strong winds that we can use to draw in wind power. And a close distance to the sun means that if we wanted to, we could certainly be a lot more solar powered than we currently are. Geothermal energy is another source we rely on in some places, like Iceland for instance, which is almost 70% powered by geothermal sources. And a healthy supply of fissionable material means that we can fuel nuclear plants for many decades to come. Compounding all of these benefits is the fact that our air and water requirements are met in abundance and our food is grown off healthy soil and feed. Everything we need is already here, so not only do we have a lot of options to power our cities, we also need less power to get by than we would on moons or planets like Mars. We unfortunately can't expect the same hospitality over there. Now there's no knowing what science and technology will make available to us in the coming 40 or 50 years, or even if it'll take that long to establish a city on Mars, it might be sooner or it might be later. That said, I'll be basing my findings off the research papers listed in the description down below. And while we're down there, press those like and subscribe buttons, it really helps out the discoverability of the channel. I'll be rating each of our options on the four criteria of cost, complexity, efficiency and reliability. Let's look at Earth's main provider first, fossil fuel. So for there to be fossil fuels on Mars would almost certainly be proof of extraterrestrial life of some sort or another. And that's certainly not impossible, but whether it's coal, gas, oil or otherwise, it's very unlikely that we're going to find fossil deposits. And even if we do find them there, extracting them in any meaningful way would be unsustainable and super expensive. The energy costs of just getting it out of the ground would massively subtract from the amount ultimately produced and sending oil or coal to Mars is absolutely out of the question given the associated costs of an interplanetary journey. SpaceX estimates around $140 per kilogram and skeptics say it's much closer to $500 per kilogram. You'd be burning fuel at a rate much faster than Earth to Mars missions can resupply and not to mention we'll be needing those resupply missions for other vital supplies that can't be produced on Mars. The biggest problem though is that burning fossil fuels in the Martian atmosphere would require consuming oxygen which I don't need to remind you is not exactly a common commodity on the planet having an atmosphere of more or less 95% carbon dioxide. We'd need to provide the oxygen ourselves and at this point it's really just not worth the pain. But do leave me a comment down below if you want to see how we will be producing oxygen on Mars with MOXIES. While we don't need oxygen to generate geothermal energy, it falls into the same labor-intensive category as fossil fuels since currently we have no idea how far down we'd need to drill to obtain practical geothermal energy or if it's there at all. And just like with fossil fuels, it'll require complicated and heavy machinery just to be able to extract it. Fossil fuel and geothermal score very low on cost, since both require huge capital investments to launch the required equipment to Mars to extract their respective resources. They also score low on complexity. Installation of plants like these is no small feat, requiring a lot of manpower and maintaining all of these moving parts on Mars will be a nightmare. As far as efficiency goes, fossil is actually pretty good at around 30 to 40%, with geothermal plants hovering around 10%. While they are relatively reliable on Earth, we can't rely on these sources at all on Mars. Martian hey. geothermal deposits are almost complete conjecture at this point, and it's not likely that we'll find coal or oil there either. 
So while theoretically, if we could get them up and running, they would be reliable, the odds of us finding geothermal sources are speculative at the moment with the odds of fossil fuel being even less likely. So all told, without some sort of breakthrough discovery, we can say with relative certainty that we won't be using geothermal or fossil fuels to power our Martian cities. According to the reconnaissance done by the Viking landers, typical Martian surface winds measure between 16 and 32 kilometers per hour, while dust storms can clock wind speeds upwards of 110. So this makes Mars a great candidate for wind power, right? Well, unfortunately, wind speed doesn't mean that much when the atmosphere on Mars is only 1% as thick as that on Earth. Now, studies have concluded that wind speed is a feasible source of energy on Mars, though these studies were considering lightweight wind turbines to power small probes. But we want to power cities, and for that we're going to need much bigger turbines. For these turbines, we need around a 10 meters per second or 36 kilometers an hour wind to generate energy on Earth. But on Mars, we need at least three times that at 30 meters per second, which you'll practically never see outside of dust storms. But that is the one benefit of harnessing the wind on Mars. While dust storms can black out the entire planet for months on end, effectively eliminating any solar power, wind can serve as a good backup during these events thanks to the increased wind speeds. Wind and solar working in tandem is very possibly a good contender for our first settlements on Mars. But that doesn't mean we're in the clear yet, because while we've got increased wind speed in a dust storm, We've also got a dust storm in a dust storm. Dust on Mars is very fine and electrostatic. So unless we find a way to completely seal off the internals, dust will get inside all of the moving parts of the turbines and will require regular cleaning. Abrasion is another mostly unavoidable issue, so they're not exactly gonna be maintenance free. Installing large wind turbines on Mars will also be challenging, even with reduced gravity, but at least the components will be under less stress, with a 2012 study finding that the strain on a Martian wind turbine would be around 10 times less than the same sized one on Earth. Overall, sustainable wind power is still moderately complex on Mars. It can be up to 60% efficient, but that's on Earth. On Mars, we can expect that number to be around 6 to 12%, very roughly speaking. The average utility turbine on Earth costs anywhere from one to four million dollars, but for a 150 kilowatt turbine on Mars, we're looking at a shipping cost alone of three million dollars. And as far as reliability goes, it won't be reliable on a day-to-day -day basis at all. But you have to give it some points for being reliable when we need it the most during those planet-wide dust storms. That leads us to solar. From the International Space Station to the Hubble Space Telescope and eventually James Webb, solar has or will power just about every mission we've done in space. And there are precedents for solar power on Mars. After all, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers were both solar powered. But like wind, solar poses a number of challenges on Mars. First of all, Mars has a solar irradiance of almost exactly 60% of Earth's, which means even on an absolutely perfect day, we're still getting less than two thirds of the efficiency we'd be getting back home. But we don't often get perfect days on the red planet. Dust isn't just a problem for wind on Mars. It was pretty much the cause of Opportunity's death in 2018 when a planetary dust storm forced it into hibernation, never to wake up. The leading theory is that the solar panels were covered in a thick layer of dust and as the batteries ran out over the nearly four month long storm, it had no way to power back on. But dust storms are short term concerns. What affects the solar panels we'd be using to power our settlements on a daily basis is the fact that there is almost always dust suspended in the atmosphere, which further reduces the already low efficiency of solar power. At best, we're relying on 30% indirect light on any given Martian day, but at worst, a majority of the light we receive will be indirect, which is really bad for our ability to produce power. This dust then slowly settles on the panels, further complicating things. In a NASA study published in 2004, scientists found a 0.3% reduction in rover solar power performance every day for the first 30 days of a mission, with about half of that reduction going forwards. This means 8.4% worse performance in the first month and 30% within six months. So we we'll basically need people or some form of robot to regularly clean the solar panels and even then we'll need a substantial amount of them to power a city which adds on to the logistic load of going to Mars in what are already really confined rocket payloads. The cost of solar panels on Mars, based on recent NASA specs and SpaceX's speculative $140 per kilogram shipping cost, comes out to around $3,000 per square meter. This is actually pretty cost effective, but the efficiency of solar power on Mars is, as discussed, really poor. While continuous maintenance does add to the complexity of solar power usage, it's a tried and tested method of production, and with humans there, it should, relatively speaking, be fairly simple to install and operate. I'll give it a moderate score for reliability, since while the sun is shining, we should be able to generate enough power for our city, presuming we've got a large enough array. 
but obviously when the dust storm comes around, they lose practically all of it. These issues are what led the most recent rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance, to run on MMRTGs, or multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which is a really long way of saying small nuclear battery. Speaking of which, nuclear is a fairly controversial power source here on Earth, but it is technically speaking really clean and super efficient. It generates around 10% of the world's energy requirements, and like fossil fuels, your average nuclear power plant has an efficiency of around 35%. But unlike fossil fuel, nuclear has a capacity factor of 93%, which means it produces its maximum amount of power 93% of the time. This absolutely dwarfs the competition. Now, currently, our nuclear power on Mars is limited to the aforementioned RTGs, which is amazing technology for long-duration missions because the plutonium-238 in the RTG's core will produce power for Perseverance, for instance, for another 14 years without maintenance. This is the same technology that's been powering Curiosity for the last 10 years. NASA's successfully tested Kilo Power project is a miniaturized nuclear reactor which uses uranium-235. It's really compact and cleanly produces 10 kilowatts of energy using sterling converters for upwards of 10 years. It does not care for dust nearly as much as solar. It isn't reliant on the existence of wind, fossil fuel, or geothermal deposits, and comes in at around twice the cost of solar. However, that cost is assuming we can't refurbish the reactor using it for another 10 years. If we can reuse them, the cost is reduced to more or less the same as the solar array, with larger reactors being more mass efficient, which matters a lot on an interplanetary expedition. Weight is everything. The Kilo Power Project is concluded, but it's been renewed in the form of the Fission Surface Power Project, and it'll be tested first on the moon. So all in all, nuclear is cost-effective, simple to set up and maintain, supremely reliable and very efficient. What to do with a depleted uranium? I don't know, but with a Martian city producing its own rocket fuel, it shouldn't be too hard to just launch it into space. The gravity is only 40% of Earth's after all. So in conclusion, the chances are that our early settlements will rely on a mixture of small nuclear reactors with solar and wind farms for emergencies. We'll also likely continue using the RTG nuclear batteries for our vehicles. Once our settlement grows, it'll almost certainly be powered by pure nuclear energy. It's cost-effective for how much power it produces, it's an easy installation and requires almost no maintenance. If we find geothermal deposits on Mars that are shallow and hot enough to easily extract, we'll probably end up using that as well. But that remains to be seen. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, give me a like, give me some feedback in the comments below. Am I wrong? Did I miss any power sources? Do you have any topics you'd like me to cover in the future? Anything at all, drop it down below. And until next time, stay curious.